uh, welcome to the Eagles World Channel. Uh, from the outset, I would like to uh, uh, ask you if you, you haven't uh, subscribed to the channel, uh, please do subscribe. Subscribe it. Uh, today we are going to have a conversation with one of uh, our distinguished personality of uh, our uh, region, uh, Gilgit Baltistan, and particularly from Hunza Valley. And uh, uh, his name is uh, uh, Mr. Ahmed Jami Sahi, who belongs to Hasu, uh, uh, a famous village with regard to the tourism resorts and destination. We are going to uh, have some discussion uh, about uh, uh, the Wahi uh, uh, culture and the language. Uh, in a contextual uh, manner, so that to know that well, what kind of things have been done so far, and more particularly uh, uh, with this uh, age of globalization, what kind of uh, impact it has on the language of small population. Uh, so though it is a Wahi, uh, primary language within the, the Indo or Iranian languages family, and broadly within uh, the Indo-European languages family. So Ahmed Jami Sahi, uh, who is uh, distinguished for uh, his uh, uh, deep uh, contribution and research on uh, the Wahi language, and more particularly within the social linguistic context. He has his master's uh, in uh, sociology, having uh, a distinction and a uh, gold medal from Karachi University. So with this short note of introduction, I would like uh, uh, to uh, ask uh, Mr. Ahmed Jami Sahi about the evolution of Wahi language within Pakistan and across the border. How uh, does he see, how does uh, he witness the changes uh, for the last few decades as he is, uh, uh, so uh, you could see, uh, seems, uh, you know, very young in, in a sense, but he's 60 plus. So it means that we will be uh, fortunate to ask him and to know about the evolution for the last few decades. Uh, thank you so much and welcome mm. once again, Mr. Ahmed Jami uh, Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Fazlamin Beg, um, for inviting me to this interview. Uh, as you know, uh, primarily I'm a sociologist. I have a great interest in understanding the relationship among people. And um, I, uh, wish to understand the organizations, their nature in detail, uh, and the relationship uh, among tribes, among families, uh, or among different um, government or non-government uh, organizations. Uh, but uh, you have rightly mentioned uh, that mother tongue or language is something uh, which is very close to our heart. Mm -hmm and especially uh, for those people who come from a rural background and they have uh, at times to migrate to urban areas mm -hmm. uh, for higher education, for the acquisition of higher education. And there, uh, a very important thing uh, or experience uh, occurs with almost each and every uh, young chap. Mm -hmm. uh, when they are far mm -hmm. away from their families, from their mm -hmm. original culture, um, uh, then they feel a thirst, you know, for uh, understanding the nature of their mother tongue. So I am in the category of sociolinguists, uh, not exactly uh, as a, a specialist in uh, languages or in linguistics, <laughs> uh, because I felt it is a social need uh, as I understand that it is the language primarily 
which distinguishes one nationality from another nationality. Mm -hmm. You know, generally, <coughs> uh, if you see at the cultural development, it is amalgamated. You know, several boundaries or uh, values, norms are mixed up among the neighborhood populations. Mm -hmm. But why we say that we are Wahi and we, we are not Burishin or not Shains or not uh, English or not Chinese or not Russians. Mm -hmm. So it is the language, you know, mm -hmm. that m makes a distinction between different uh, communities or between different nationalities. So that is the importance of a language. As far the uh, growth or development of Wahi language is concerned, I perceive <laughs> that the scholars have this, um, uh, you know, agreement that the Wahi uh, people and language uh, has existed existed for the past more than three thousand years now. Uh, among whom, as you know, the famous. Uh, writers uh, who has written the socio uh, linguistic survey of northern areas peter backstrom peter backstrom uh, and uh, from the united dr. states dr herman and several Absolutely. other linguists uh, you know who agree that uh, the wahi uh, people and language is more than 3000 uh, years old so that indicates that the wahi uh, which originates, the people who originate from Wuhan, many people ask this critical question that, by and large, where from these Wahs migrated to Wuhan itself? If we, you know, dig a little bit um, this term, then we come to the conclusion that there is another area in Tajikistan which is known as Wahsh. And there is also smaller areas which are named like Wahjir or something, which indicates some, th some relationship with Wahis, you know. So as I perceive that the people of Wahan have migrated from Central Asia, from Wahsh area into Wahan. And the Wahan Valley has been named after this, you know, because from Wahi, uh, usually this Wahi has been termed by outsiders to the people living in Wahan Corridor, whereas the mm. Wahis themselves, they call or they term themselves as, uh, they term their original space from where they have migrated to the neighborhood areas as Wuh, and the people are known as Wuhik, which has abbreviated letter as Hik, and their language <coughs> is known as Hik or Zik. Mm -hmm. Zik in Wahi language denotes a language. Mm -hmm. So Hik or Zik means the Wahi language. So that is the origin of this language. As uh, you have studied and traveled more than uh, I have done, uh, in different age and in different uh, era. You know, people from Wakhan have been migrating to neighborhood areas and in some places they have retained and maintained their identity even till now. Uh, like the Tajik Milize uh, in Goma district, I think in China, and the Tashkurhan area where the Waks have maintained <coughs> their uh, language and culture. Mm. And similarly, uh, the people in Upper Hunza, which is known as Gujal um, nowadays, uh, is an administrative uh, sub district or subdivision uh, of Hunza district. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, uh, later in a quite later stage, uh, some Wahis have migrated from Wahan Corridor to Ishkoman Valley. And some have migrated uh, to Upper Chitral, <coughs> uh, which is the uh, neighborhood uh, valley of the Wuhan Corridor to Barogal area, mm -hmm. and have settled there. Mm -hmm. So the causes of migration have been described 
in different ways. You know, some migrations have taken place by people uh, who were not happy with the governors or with the uh, kings of their time in Wakhan. Uh, they had some differences. So I think some people have migrated because of those differences, because they couldn't survive under those rulers. And if we study uh, the period of Great Gen, uh, which happened between British uh, Empire and the Russian Empire, mm -hmm. you know, and both these empires or both big powers were trying to grab more and more regions and more and more areas, and um, they were advancing, uh, the Russians were advancing from Central Asian side towards Wuhan Corridor, whereas the British government uh, was advancing uh, from gilgit Baltistan side, mm -hmm. you know, and finally they came to an agreement that mm -hmm. the people of Wuhan are relatively peaceful <coughs> or peace-loving people. Therefore, they termed mm -hmm. uh, that very as buffer zone, uh, which perhaps means uh, that uh, the people who love peace, therefore, uh, it should be no man's land mm -hmm. sort of place. Mm -hmm. You know, nor the Russians should cross that valley, nor from mm -hmm. the south the uh, British Empire should mm -hmm. cross uh, Wuhan mm -hmm. corridor and move toward Central yeah. Asia. So, uh, so uh, the, during that period, you know, many people migrated from Afghan Wuhan corridor uh, towards Ishkoman Valley and uh, Yarkun Valley, Valley, Yarkun Valley uh, because the governments of that time, either from Russian side or from Kabul, um, Afghanistan. Afghanistan kings, there, were, there was pressure uh, upon Wahis uh, to <laughs> become part of their forces <laughs> and fight against their uh, or opponents. Mm -mm. So they forced some of the peace-loving people uh, to migrate along with their families mm -hmm. towards these southern valleys mm -hmm. from their origin, original uh, area, <coughs> and they settled in these areas. All right. Um, uh, as far as the growth of the language is concerned, although it never remained a written language, although there are some theories by some people that uh, the Mazdaq, Ahura Mazdaq, Mazda, uh, Mazda mm -hmm. uh, actually was born in some Wahi part. The, this is one of the, uh, you know, myths. Theories maybe. Or, or yeah. theory or a myth that some people believe <laughs> that why his thoughts or his uh, theology uh, was written and great books came into existence like the Avista uh, because there was some script available in the distant past mm -hmm. but it yet needs to be further researched. Mm -hmm. However, the noun history tells us that the Wahis of these different regions which we talked about <coughs> like the Wahis in Tajik part of uh, or the upper delta of um, uh, river Oxus mm -hmm. and the people living in actual Wakhan corridor and the people living in Tashkurgan area or Daftar big village in that area and the people living in Upper Hunza or Ishkoman Valley since they had no common written script therefore they grew in their own respect according to their own geographical and social setups naturally they encountered their own different neighbors, like the people in Tashkurhan, uh, the Chinese language dominates or culture dominates uh, that area. So automatically, uh, many terms and many words, mm -hmm. uh, loan words, you know, <coughs> intruded into their language on Chinese side. Likewise, in Tajikistan, Dari is the main uh, language, Taj which is also Tajiki, known as yeah. Tajiki. Uh, so, <coughs> other smaller communities living in Pamir, you know, there are so many languages there, you have visited that area like the Shirnani, 
or Shogni uh, and the Wahi and the Bartangi and the Yazgulami and uh, many uh, yes Ishkashmi and many other languages. <coughs> so I think they are naturally influenced mm -hmm. uh, by the effect and impact of the Tajiki or the Dari uh, Persian uh, language. Mm -hmm. However, you know, as far as its written history is concerned, those explorers, you know, the British explorers especially, and the Russian explorers who visited the Wakhan corridor on Tajikistan side or on Afghanistan, Afghanistan side, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they collected certain glossary or collection of words and they also, some of them also tried uh, in their own context to understand mm -hmm. uh, the nature of <coughs> Wahi language. Okay. So may I interrupt here for a while, please? So thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, giving us uh, a detailed <laughs> background about the Wahi family or Wahi Tajik language. Uh, so uh, could we uh, come to uh, a point and to see in your own lifetime, for example, now you are uh, 60 plus, uh, so if we go back and observe your mother tongue, the Wahi language, that when you were 10 years old, uh, and from uh, that time onward uh, to this time, what kind of changes you see, you know, practically in your language? I, I think, Mr. Fazl Amin Sahib, that uh, there is uh, a lot of change, or very fast change, especially in uh, uh, in, langu uh, in uh, linguistic terms, we call it language switching. So the language switch has increased tremendously these days, because on the one hand, uh, we are influenced <coughs> by English, which is an international language and a lingua franca globally. So many tourists, thousands of tourists, they visit Hunza Valley, Upper Hunza Valley, which is Gojal, and other valleys of the uh, northern Pakistan. And similarly, our national language is Urdu, you know, and we have several Urdu TV channels. You know, we have read, uh, radio media and we have print media and many other sources of uh, language, you know, which are intruding and naturally influencing our language too. Mm -hmm. So our younger generation, knowingly or unknowingly, they switch their language uh, several times into English, into Urdu and into other neighborhood languages. So, I think uh, when we were young and small kids, you know, at that time the language was much pure, uh, our uh, previous generation and the generation before that, you know, our papas and grandpas and mamas and grandma, uh, they were speaking in pure Wahi, whereas that can't be expected in today's world because of the tourist influence, because of the media influence, and because of the schooling system. You know, because our kids, they move to educational institutions, locally, regionally, and nationally. And some of our uh, children, you know, they move even uh, across the national border and uh, move to international institutions for higher learning. So when they return back, they do not lose part of their language, but they also bring in new terms, new ideas, and new thoughts. Mm -hmm. So that is how I, as I see and foresee it, that the change is tremendous, uh, which is not fully understood by educated as well as our illiterate people. But the change is taking place at a very fast pace. Thank you once again, Ahmed Jami Sahisa. So uh, another question I would like to ask, uh, uh, for example, in the context of Gilgit Baltistan uh, and Chitral, in particularly, uh, in this region, uh, you see there are uh, more than 10 languages spoken here. 
and uh, then in this age of uh, globalization there are a lot of uh, things which has its uh, positive uh, uh, impact as well as negative so one of uh, the, the theories or the notions uh, as the different experts have given that well the languages of small population like Wafi or uh, other languages as spoken indigenously in this uh, region they are uh, endangered and some of them uh, may lose their uh, identity and particularly at the verge of extinction. How do you see Wahi and other languages of Gilgit, Pakistan and Chitral region? Uh, and then what could be done in that respect? Uh, thank you uh, for uh, you know, raising this critical issue. As far as I understand, there is a positive side of it or a hope uh, that these languages might survive uh, maybe in the next 500 years or 1,000 years or more. Uh, because our younger generation, uh, on the one hand, we are losing, as I already narrated, uh, part of our cultural norms, values, and uh, words, terms of mother tongue. But on the other side, many new educated youngsters are coming forward. You know, they are conducting researches into these native languages. Uh, there is national as well as international, uh, you know, interest uh, in, in the languages that are spoken in this part of the world because uh, <coughs> the anthropologists, the linguists, and the historians, they feel that these languages embody not only uh, you know words but the embody essence of culture and you know there is a lot of hidden human history mm -hmm. you know attached to these languages yeah so therefore that again uh, gives us a hope uh, that uh, the institutions uh, which are working for the uh, protection, preservation, and promotion of these languages. Um, that is a hope uh, for the educated people and the language of ling uh, the Department of Linguistics uh, in Karakram in University. In University. Uh, and uh, there is another uh, hope that uh, the local government or the native government, uh, provincial government, uh, is considering uh, of making. Uh, these native languages part of curriculum at primary level. So if that happens, then uh, we hope that these languages will survive longer. Mm -hmm. And these languages will survive if the people themselves, you know, they take interest into their mother tongue and they keep speaking it. They respect their culture and their language. They respect their, if they continue, to respect their elders, you know, and opted and adopted to their uh, languages, then these languages will survive. Yeah, so right. it will survive because of us. And yeah. these languages will become endangered or will wither away because of us. Yeah, if, for example, uh, uh, the native people uh, or communities of Gilgit, Pakistan, and Chitral, and across the border, if they would speak, they think that, well, it is their responsibility to speak and to convey it to their children. And on the other hand, if they uh, become irresponsible, then there will be the negative aspect. If they are responsible, responsibly taking interest in it and then convey it to their uh, children, uh, then it could survive or sustain in the near future. So one of the, uh, uh, maybe this could be the last uh, question. Sure. For example, you rightly mentioned about uh, uh, you know, the local government's interest and uh, patronage with regard to uh, the local or the native languages uh, 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 preservation and promotion uh, at primary level in the schools, you see. So, for example, in that respect, when we see uh, here, uh, uh, you know it very well, uh, when we uh, talk, uh, talk of uh, introducing them uh, in the schools and like, for example, Wahi. Uh, so you, you saw that, well, the basic thing was with regard to the script, where the local government, you know, they they try to influence our people to uh, 
uh, against their will you know, uh, for the script. And the same happened uh, or uh, uh, holds true with regard to Basti language. Uh, so uh, how it could be then introduced, for example, the uh, basic uh, thing in the schools to introduce to the, to the children is the script itself. So uh, what would be uh, your, respond, uh, your response to it? Uh, thank you very much. I, I believe uh, that uh, the Wahis have rightly raised their right uh, to speak or their right to write uh, in the script of their own liking, uh, you know, uh, their mother tongue, because it is the mother tongue of the Wahis and none else. So therefore, uh, the decision about the adoption of the script should be made by the native speakers, So, which is done in favor of anglicized script. <laughs> Uh, which, uh, as you know, uh, it was um, first uh, introduced uh, by the globally renowned Wahi first PhD from Tajikistan, Dr. Bogshaw Lashkar Bikuf. So you uh, further propagated it and convinced our people to some extent and the uh, Forum for Language Initiatives also introduced it to some extent. Did, did I propagate it or did no. I promote it? No, sir, you promoted it. <laughs> yes, you promoted okay, okay. it, of course. I shouldn't say propagate okay, okay. it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, somehow publicizing or okay, propagating okay. is yeah, also right. correct okay. uh, term. Yeah. So I think now, uh, globally, since English is a global language, its script is global, uh, and its vowels are more easy to adopt and to pronounce these languages, these mountain languages. So I believe uh, that the uh, primer that has been recently uh, promoted or um, published uh, by Wahid Tajik Culture Association uh, should be acceptable to the local government and uh, to our people across the border. Because this is a global uh, era. Uh, the electronic technology, you know, the internet has made all communities global. Mm -hmm. So our community are permanently settled in more than six countries and our highly educated youth are settled globally in different big cities like um, Sydney, Australia or London or New York City of USA and Ekaterina Burg uh, in Russia, Moscow and Canada, etc. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that makes us a global community. Uh, therefore, um, the script that has been prepared by uh, Wahi Taji Culture ex uh, Association should be acceptable to the local government as well. So thank you so much. Uh, I wish uh, that we should con uh, we could continue it uh, because of uh, the length of uh, the video. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, I'm compelled to end it up here. But with this note that, uh, uh, as you have rightly mentioned, the significance of uh, uh, the Wahi Pamiri language, and not only in a, a historical context, but also uh, highlighting uh, many crucial aspects of this language. Uh, up to his time, your own time, our time, uh, and also uh, shedding uh, light on uh, the languages of small population of Gilgit, Pakistan, and Chitral as well, and uh, across the border uh, in Central Asia. So uh, I'm so much grateful to you uh, for sparing uh, it was a a pleasure. Time. It was a pleasure talking and to you. Thank you very much. And your Thank knowledge you so much. to uh, uh, this channel. At the end, I would like to uh, thank, uh, to, I would like to pay my gratitude to uh, our uh, videographers, uh, both uh, my nephew Tosif, uh, Tosif Ahmed Sahi and also uh, to my daughter Surush Eman Beg uh, that you helped us, facilitated us uh, with regard to this program. Welcome. Thank you so much. Welcome.